let's talk about what we should eat or what we used to eat. First of all, none of us were there. <laughs> and none of the people who tend to write and make suppositions about what humans used to eat were there. So here again, we have to make inferences. And part of the problem, in my opinion, with much of the work that has been done from an anthropological perspective on human diets were done by Western European men who basically had their heads in the wrong part of their anatomy. They came to this issue with the assumption that meat was important for human physiology, human development, uh, for uh, uh, human survival. And nothing could be further from the truth. I, when I gave my lecture on uh, uh, diet and design, I specifically addressed the fact that because of our small stomachs, and our inability to eat carrion, the maximum number of calories that we can get from a package of, of animal protein is limited. Furthermore, we can't utilize any of that protein over and above whatever our daily needs uh, consist of, and that's gonna be a very small percentage. So from that perspective, it is a complete waste of time to spend hours and hours and hours and risk injury chasing around animals trying to kill them to hunt them when you don't really get a nutritional benefit from it, if you understand what I mean. Not in equatorial areas. However, if you decide to move up to places where plants die off during the winter time and there is no plant food available, then you have a reason that you have to eat animals. Because uh, or if you move into what I call a marginal environment, say a, a, a scrub desert environment where the types of plants that grow there are not plants that humans can easily eat and assimilate, then you start herding so that you use animals to transform that roughage into a form that you can access. But all of that was late in human uh, 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 history and human civilization. And the point is, by the time we were smart enough to do these things, we had already been given a suite of organs and uh, physiology by our plant-eating ancestors. So at that point, it doesn't matter what we do. I mean, I can get on an airplane and fly through the air at 600 miles an hour, but I better not jump out of it. <laughs> because if I do, I'm going to die. That does not mean I can fly. It just means I can use technology to overcome my anatomic and physiologic limitations. So the, the point is, again, I, I said this yesterday, even the best predators on this planet can, um, and I'm sorry for the, uh, for, I'll put it uh, facing the microphone, can only make a kill every seven to 10 days. Human beings can't even get anywhere near that efficient. And furthermore, if we do manage to kill a large bodied animal, most of it will go to waste because it will start to rot before we can uh, uh, consume it. So again, Hunting is not an effective survival strategy for people living in equatorial areas. However, if you're living in the Arctic or you're living somewhere where the body will freeze and not rot, then it does become useful. But again, by that point, what you, what you are adapted to eat is moot because you're adapted to eat plants, but you learn to utilize other animals to get your calories, if, if what I'm saying is making sense to you. So, Humans were never hunter-gatherers. At best, we were gatherers, and occasionally we hunted. Uh, but even in modern Stone Age tribes, 80 to 90% of the calories are provided by the gathering efforts of women. The men are, um, whatever they bring home, actually is pretty immaterial, if you think about it. Because if I took away 80% of the food that you would eat, say, between now and June, you'd still be here. But if I only, I mean, excuse me, if I took away 20% of the food that you will eat between now and June, you'd still be here. Probably be maybe a little thinner, uh, but you'd still be here. If I took away 80%, you'd be dead. 
So my point is that humans have always subsisted and survived on plant foods primarily. Yeah, I'll do the Adventist study, but first I want to add a little bit in defense of the nutritional anthropologists. <laughs> Um, if you look carefully at some of the studies, especially Melvin Connor and Boyd Eaton, uh, there are two studies where they actually uh, provided, a, a, I think, a reasonable guesstimate of what people during Paleolithic times actually consumed. They say very clearly, during the first 80% of the Paleolithic period, we were plant eaters. It wasn't until the last 20% that people started moving north and, and began to hunt more. But even then, and even for those people, they still ate a lot of plants. And that is validated when you look at their estimates of what humans actually consumed they estimated that humans consumed somewhere between 70 and 150 grams of fiber per day. Uh, so the, the 70 at the low end, that was the people that were doing more of the hunting. Uh, the 150 plus were people doing so, so more of the gathering. So it really ought to be called gatherer, hunter, sure. poopers. <laughs> exactly. It's a, 150 grams of fiber it, a day, you, you it, need to leave a lot of time. It's, it's a far greater amount of fiber, it's a far greater amount of fiber than the average vegan eats. And we need to recognize that a, a lot of wild plants are three to four times more concentrated in fiber than our cultivated plants that we bred to be more palatable uh, to, the, to us. And, and so that's something that factors in. Uh, but, but I think the point here is that if you look at the numbers, uh, vitamin C intakes were five or six hundred milligrams. Uh, the, the guesstimates, uh, potassium seven to twelve or to, to ten thousand uh, milligrams. Uh, those numbers vegans don't see generally. Uh, they and and those are nutrients that are concentrated in plant foods. Uh, so th th these folks were eating a lot of plants. And, and uh, one thing that I did at one point, when I first looked at that nutritional anthropology, I thought to myself, there is no way that people eating a so-called paleo diet today are even coming close to what true Paleolithic man actually consumed. So I did the math. Um, I did the math and I took three days worth of recommended paleo menus from the most popular paleo website and I analyzed the diets and then I did the same for a purely exclusively plant-based diet, three days of recommended menus analyzed. And then I compared them to the Paleolithic estimates. And the, the paleo folks had three nutrients or four nutrients that were actually closer to true Paleolithic people than the vegans. Um, and they were vitamin A, uh, cholesterol, uh, zinc, uh, and I think, I forget, protein, of course, protein, about 30% of calories from protein. The vegans had, I think, 13 nutrients closer to a true Paleolithic diet than what people are calling paleo today. So I think we are actually eating a plant-exclusive diet closer to a true paleolithic diet than people who claim. I, what I don't get is why paleo people trying to eat paleo are so focused on trying to get that 30% of calories from protein, but they don't care anything about getting the 70 to 150 grams of, of, of fiber or the five to 600 uh, milligrams of vitamin C. So, and then somebody else did the math. Uh, you did the math in terms of if everybody on this planet ate paleo, tell that story. I, I will. Um, so I'll, I'll come to that in a second. I actually want to jump on the nutrient bandwagon because there, there's something really fascinating here. So you may not all remember this, but there was a time when the recommended daily allowance for folate was 200 micrograms a day. It was doubled to 400 micrograms a day because of decisive epidemiologic evidence that the higher intake of folate around the time of conception massively reduced the risk of neural tube defects, a kind of birth anomaly, congenital anomaly. 
at the same time and totally independently this exact work that Brenda's citing, um, Mel Connor, Boyd Eaton, and others, using, and you know, the, you're wondering how do they know about nutrients? So they're studying dental wear patterns. They're also studying coprolis, which are fossilized fecal remains, archaeological remains, and so forth. So, you know, triangulating every source of evidence they, they can. But this same body of evidence suggested that our native Paleolithic intake of folate was about 400 micrograms a day. It, it was stunning that the epidemiology, totally independent, was looking for the right answer for health, and it was a bullseye on the estimate of what our native intake level was, and that's happened with several other nutrients as well. So really interesting. So you know, I, I think what we're adapted to does have relevance, but I, I agree it becomes a pop culture fad where you pick one element out of the, 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 the so-called story that you like, you focus on that and you lose the big picture. Um, in terms of space, so I, yeah, I did this calculation for a column in the Huffington Post some years ago. You can look at multiple sources in the anthropology literature. How much space do you need to make a living as a hunter-gatherer? So I looked at all the credible sources I could find, took the average, and multiplied it by 7.8 billion, which was the number of homo sapiens on the planet at that time. It's gone up slightly since. And my calculation was that for the current population of the world to live that way would require 15 times the surface area of the planet, including all of the oceans, the polar caps, and the Sahara Desert. So good luck with that. Um, I, I just want to pop in for just a minute because you're absolutely right about Boyd Eaton and his colleagues, but they are really sort of the second wave of anthropologists who've come back, who came back, looked at what these original anthropologists were saying and said, you know what, these guys need more fiber in their diet. And because Boyd Eaton uh, um, published a very famous paper uh, called The Seed Eaters, I think. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, that was Clifford Jolly, forgive me. Um, but he did uh, an analysis of wild foods that were eaten by um, Stone Age tribes in Africa and compared them to the plant foods that they ate. And what he ended up with was the wild animal foods had a calorie content of 1.41 calories per gram. And the wild plant foods had a calorie content of 1.29 calories per gram. Now, if you remember your arithmetic and you can round up and round down, you've got 1.3 versus 1.4. Statistically, that really is no significant difference in calories. But when you look at the nutrient content of those foods, people who were getting their uh, uh, calories and nutrients from plant foods would be much better off than people who are running around chasing stuff they were unlikely to catch. And again, that argues that people living in equatorial areas were much more likely to spend their time uh, getting high quality plant foods than wasting their time chasing animals that they, again, were very unlikely to catch and also highly likely to become injured if they tried to catch it. And a lot of these anthropologists have come up with these ridiculous theories that, well, the way humans hunted was we, quote, ran animals to exhaustion. First of all, <laughs> it, thank you, okay? I, I would love to see somebody run uh, uh, an antelope to exhaustion. I, I'm waiting to see that. But from a metrics standpoint, that is a losing strategy because that means you are going to expend, and especially collectively, thousands of calories chasing an animal that at most you can extract maybe three or four hundred calories from as an individual. That is a complete waste and that is a calorie sink that if you do that day after day, you're going to end up starving to death. So that no existing predator on this planet ever has, has in the past or currently uses the strategy of running animals to exhaustion. That's, that's foolish. It's, 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 it's actually stupid um, because it's just a monumental waste of energy. You, you look at extant predators, they will chase animals for maybe three, four hundred yards. If they don't catch up to them, they leave them alone because they know better than to waste their time and energy. Then some other researchers said, oh, well, humans ate, uh, they scavenged. They scavenged from carcasses on the savannah. Really? 
People end up in the ER every Thanksgiving from poorly cooked turkey, and they've got ranges at home that cost thousands of dollars. <laughs> You're trying to tell me that these people were scavenging off rotting carcasses on the savanna? That is complete male bovine fertilizer, okay? <laughs> It's, it's, and, and, and you ask, why, why do people come up with these ridiculous theories? It's because they have a misplaced understanding of the importance of animal foods. Animal foods are not important for our survival. They are not necessary. And I don't think that early human ancestors in equatorial regions wasted their time hunting, not until they moved up north, developed hunting cultures, and then brought them back into Africa. We're, we're spending a lot of time on the question, but it's a really interesting question. So just a little bit more, we've invoked Boyd Eaton's name a couple of times, and Boyd and Mel Connor really are sort of the founding fathers of our modern understanding of Paleolithic nutrition. Boyd also happens to be a dear friend uh, and a lovely gentleman. And I'd like to commend something to your collective attention. In 2015 in Boston, uh, Walter Willett and I were privileged to co-chair a conference called Old Ways Common Ground. So Old Ways, which is a nonprofit, was the convener. And the goal was to look for the common ground among very divergent views in nutrition. So we had some ardent advocates of plant-exclusive eating, but we invited the paleo experts. Boyd was there. I, I had the privilege of introducing Boyd Eaton to Neil Barnard, for example. So I mean, there, there were some really interesting interactions at the conference. But if you Google Old Ways Common Ground, you'll find all of the conference materials. And among them, you'll see a presentation by one of the world's leading authorities on the Paleolithic diet explaining why modern day humans need to eat a lot less meat or maybe none. And that adds something really important to this dialogue because it's not just us inside our temple preaching to one another. It's really powerful when you have somebody else from a very different camp say, these guys are right. <laughs>